I want you to hit me as hard as you can. There seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Hello? Oh, yeah! Ah! Whoa! Hey, whoa, 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 whoa! Did I frighten you? Hello, and welcome back to Animation Movies Revisited, where we take a look back at some of the greatest animated films and rediscover why they've left a lasting impression throughout the years. This time out, we're going back to where it all began for Pixar Studios, with an investigative look into their first animated feature film, Toy Story. The year was 1995. Pogs were all the rage, Seinfeld was one of the most popular shows on television, and the world's first computer animated film had arrived to revolutionize the industry and summon a sea change that would trap classic animation methods in a powerful undertow. One of the benefits of being an old is that I got to experience many of the films we talk about for this series in theaters firsthand. I remember being mesmerized by the evolutionary leap that Toy Story represented and hearing the excited chatter of my fellow audience members as we exited the theater, surprised and delighted by what we just witnessed. Toy Story wasn't a garden variety animated romp, it was a game changer. From this point forward, nearly every animation studio under the sun needed to rethink its strategy if it hoped to weather the oncoming storm and embrace the medium's future. Thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, like this video, click on the bell to receive notifications every time a new one goes up. Now back to the show. To understand where Toy Story came from, we have to go back to 1974, when the New York Institute of Technology's founder, Alexander Schur, established the Computer Graphics Lab, whose computer scientists hoped to create industry-changing animation with the push of a button. After spending upward of $15 million on developing their technology, CGL decided they needed the help of a major film studio to realize their potential. Enter Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas, who escorted six of GCL's employees over to Lucasfilm, where they eventually joined the graphics group at the famed Star Wars-related studio. As members of the graphics group, the team helped lay the foundational bricks for CG technology, including the Alpha Channel, which determines how pixels are rendered and combined to achieve partial or total transparency for the desired image. Eventually, John Lasseter was hired by Lucasfilm as an interface designer and served as an animator on the animated short film The Adventures of Andre and Wally B. Several projects later, the department changed its name to Pixar, and was eventually purchased by Apple's Steve Jobs in 1986. Lasseter was hired to produce the short film Tin Toy to kick things off for the newly established outfit. Told from the perspective of a toy soldier, Tin Toy tells the tale of a musically gifted military man and his harrowing encounter with a destructive infant. While the short depicts a level of parental negligence beyond my comprehension, and features crude character models and animation by today's standards, it was seen as a monumental achievement by Disney. They wanted Lasseter to be their next star director for an animated feature film. But Lasseter's loyalty to Pixar was unwavering. Unwilling to let someone with so much potential escape their grasp, the Walt Disney Company's CEO Michael Eisner and chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg offered a production deal that preserved Pixar's independence but carried the Disney brand. At first, Pixar offered to create a holiday special titled A Tin Toy Christmas. However, Katzenberg thought the concept wasn't ambitious enough and proposed making a big splash with a feature-length animated film. It's well documented that Katzenberg's go big or go home attitude was so that he could gain access to Lasseter's talents and that the deal would come with stipulations for all involved. He explained to Pixar that maintaining their independence meant playing nice with the House of Mouse, and that they'd be micromanaged throughout production. While this might sound harsh, the reality was that Pixar was in debt and needed Mickey's money in a big way. Naturally, the negotiations were contentious, but eventually, both groups agreed to combine their efforts for an animated feature based on Tin Toy, with the working title, Toy Story. The original plot for Toy Story revolved around Tinny, Pixar's nickname for their wind-up toy soldier character, going on a vacation with his owner. After Tinny gets left behind at a truck stop, a junk collector discovers him and tosses the toy into the back of his pickup truck. In the back of the vehicle, he meets an old-timey ventriloquist dummy. 
After becoming fast friends, Tinny and the dummy embark on a quest to find a place where they'll be valued. After a series of mishaps, the duo arrives at a toy heaven, also known as preschool. It's there that Tinny and his friend never get lost or outgrown. They've found their nirvana. Eventually, Lassiter and his team realized that they would have to change the project's characters and setting. One of the primary reasons for this was that no one would ever believe that a wind-up soldier was a child's favorite toy. Thus, the team began working on a toy character that any child would die to have. Lassiter, Andrew Stanton, Pete Docter, and John Ranft came up with a Spaceman character provisionally named Lunar Larry. After a few tweaks to the character's design, the group decided that the name Lunar Larry was too wacky and began tossing space terms into their think tank. Eventually, they solved the problem by naming the character Buzz Lightyear. He was named so in honor of the Apollo 11 astronaut Edwin Buzz Aldrin and the astrological unit of distance known as a light year. At first, the team wanted to pair Buzz with a ventriloquist dummy complete with top hat and tails, but Bud Lucky had the idea of making the toy a cowboy. Shortly after that, an attitudinal cowpoke moseyed onto the scene with a design inspired by Lassiter's old Casper doll. The duo represented a classic East meets West setup. The Spaceman and the Cowboy, an unlikely pair, would have to learn to work together if they hoped to survive the adventure of a lifetime. Now that Woody and Buzz were the film's dynamic duo, Pixar began working on test footage to wow the executives. The samples demonstrated how far the team could push the technology and gave the investors a taste of things to come. Directed by John Lasseter, the concepts, characters, and plot for Toy Story were co-created by Lasseter, Pete Docter, Andrew Stanton, and Joe Ramft. The final narrative revolved around an eclectic group of toys who encounter a state-of-the-art action figure named Buzz Lightyear. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. Oh, I'm so glad you're not a dinosaur! Who unwittingly sows a seed of disorder among the group. When Andy's favorite toy, a pole-string-operated cattleman named Woody, feels threatened by Buzz's arrival, the possessive cowpoke executes a plan to take Buzz out of the picture. When Woody's scheme backfires, he and Buzz must work together if they're to return home before Andy and the rest of the toys move to their new home. During their adventure, Woody and Buzz encounter alien creatures, a sadistic destroyer of toys, an unrelenting bull terrier, and the harsh realities of their plastic existence for a story as human as it is fictional and fantastic. During the casting phase of the project, Paul Newman, Clint Eastwood, and Robin Williams were all considered for the part of Woody. Eventually, Pixar went with Lasseter's top choice and Academy Award winner, Tom Hanks. Hanks was fascinated by Woody immediately, especially after Pixar showed the actor an animation demo of Woody reciting dialogue from Hanks' 1989 comedy, Turner and Hooch. What? Are you, if you're hungry, finish the hamburgers! You, eat the buns! What is it? Are you, if you're hungry, finish the hamburgers! You, you're not thirsty, you don't, you're not touching the water! Disney often used demos like these to butter the talent before making a deal to join the production. Some people say that flattery won't get you anywhere, but it worked like a charm in Hanks' case. Billy Crystal was offered the role of Buzz Lightyear but turned it down because he didn't think the animation style would go over well with audiences. He was incorrect, but Crystal also regretted his decision and later accepted the role of Mike Wazowski for Pixar's fourth CG animated feature, Monsters, Inc. When Crystal passed on the opportunity, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, and Jim Carrey were considered for Buzz's part. Ultimately, Lasseter brought the character to Tim Allen, who at the time was the star of Home Improvement. Buzz was more superhero than space cop initially, but Allen brought maturity to the character that the filmmakers did not anticipate. Joining Hanks and Allen for Pixar's groundbreaking feature debut were Don Rickles as Mr. Potato Head, the late and great Jim Varney as Slinky Dog, Wallace Shawn as Rex, John Ratzenberger as Ham, Annie Potts as Bo Peep, with John Morris as Andy, Eric Von Detten as Sid, and Laurie Metcalf as Mrs. Davis, Andy's mom. With an assortment of Hollywood heavy hitters and seasoned voice actors committed to helping Pixar make history, Toy Story was well to become a reality. One of the most significant changes to Toy Story came when Katzenberg asked Pixar to change its approach to the film's main characters, 
Woody and Buzz. Disney wanted Toy Story to appeal to children and adults alike, so they asked that mature themes be added to the story. At first, Pixar was unsure of pushing its star players into more adult and existential situations. Even Tom Hanks was uncertain of the request, saying that the changes to Woody made him into a self-serving jerk. There was also the Black Friday incident, which refers to an early film screening of Toy Story for executives. And I tell you, I sat there and I was pretty much embarrassed with what was on the screen. The showing was such a calamity that Disney's head of animation, Peter Schneider, pressed pause on the film's production. Dismayed by the results, Lasseter did his best to explain that Disney had altered the DNA of the movie by changing the characters. They were no longer flawed. They were mean. They invested in the wrong project if Disney wanted something edgy instead of wholesome and nostalgic. Thankfully, Katzenberg gave Lasseter's writing team another crack at the screenplay and eventually, both parties arrived at a happy medium. With the tone of the characters and story finally settled, the crew increased from 24 to 110, with specialized animators making up the lion's share of the new hires. The rewrites to the script saw Woody going from a conniving devil-on-the-shoulder sort to a respected member of the toy community. The revised screenplay also added a new scene, which saw the toys holding a town meeting before the big move. This moment in the film helped establish Woody's place as a leader in the toy community and introduced a workplace comedy angle to the story. After making a reluctant budgetary adjustment, a few significant changes to the script, and enduring many sleepless nights, Toy Story would change the animation landscape at any cost. Pixar was sailing in uncharted waters when they made Toy Story in terms of animation. They were pioneers on the verge of developing an animation method that would become the industry standard. The tools they developed were so new that animators hired for the film needed to learn them from scratch. Everything was a learning process, and they'd soon discover that they needed all kinds of artists for the job. The world of Toy Story needed to be believable. The film required meticulous attention to detail, as every asset was created and animated to perfection. Like any other animated film, Toy Story began as a series of storyboard images before moving on to animation. A total of 27 animators created 400 character models to manipulate throughout the adventure, each coded with a complex level of articulation. With eight separate teams assigned to perfect each shot, the project welcomed several cooks into one kitchen. In addition to animating characters, Pixar was tasked with bringing audiences into an authentic world. The design team smoothed many of the film's straight edges, making particular objects more aesthetically pleasing. While pleasurable shapes were all well and good, the film also required realistic lighting and shading. These elements helped give characters and their environment a level of semi-realism, establishing an uncanny valley as deceptive as it was mesmerizing. Something that sets Toy Story apart from other animated films at Disney's classic library is that it is not a musical. The decision to have Toy Story be devoid of song and dance numbers was a conscious one, and made some team members nervous about the film's ability to appeal to audiences. Disney had a long history of introducing audiences to marketable earworms, but instead gave them Randy Newman. Newman composed the soundtrack for Toy Story, which included the memorable track, You've Got a Friend in Me. While the film failed to include car trip worthy bangers like A Whole New World from Disney's Aladdin or Under the Sea from The Little Mermaid, Newman's folksy songs were charming and emotional. Some people would argue that Newman's soundtrack helped pave the way for a different approach to soundtracks for animated films, and parents were thrilled about the change to Disney's well worn formula. Due to the divide between Disney and Pixar, Toy Story had two premieres. The Disney premiere screened at their El Capitan Theater in Los Angeles, California, on November 19, 1995. Meanwhile, Pixar's debut happened at the Regency Center in San Francisco the following evening. When Toy Story opened to general audiences across 2,281 screens, it earned over $244 million during its theatrical run. Disney and Pixar spent an additional $20 million in marketing materials to promote Toy Story to its target audience. I'm talking about Burger King Kids Meals, Woody and Buzz slapped onto soda cans, and signature sneakers featuring the film's most beloved characters. As it turns out, Toy Story was a problematic film to promote 
given the rights to several of its characters belonging to competing toy companies. No one involved in the making of Toy Story had anticipated the film's overwhelming success. Investors were wiping their asses with Benjamins, and Pixar had established itself as a force to be reckoned with practically overnight. The film went on to win several awards for its outstanding excellence, including eight Annie Awards. The whole world was captivated by what Pixar achieved with its first feature film. Meanwhile, competing studios were busy rethinking the lasting appeal of 2D animation, and whether or not it was a dying art form. I've already peppered this episode with details about the legacy of Toy Story. However, what Pixar and Disney were able to accomplish with this wholly original and unorthodox film cannot be understated. Toy Story marked the beginning of an industry-wide shift in the art of animation filmmaking. It introduced characters that reside in the hearts and minds of millions. Since the original's release, the Toy Story franchise has expanded to include three theatrical sequels, several short films, video games, and theme park attractions. In fact, this summer we'll see the release of a Toy Story spin-off titled Lightyear. What? Starring Chris Evans as the voice of the fearless space ranger, Buzz Lightyear. I believe Toy Story is everlasting, and that we'll see these characters represented and reintroduced for generations to come. Despite earning a place of prominence in the annals of animation history, I do not think that Toy Story is a perfect film. Is it endearing? Absolutely. Did it introduce the most remarkable change in animation filmmaking in several decades? You bet. However, the technological seams of Toy Story look a mite frayed after so many years. Some human character models border on the brink of grotesque, and select movements appear jerky and unnatural. While I admire the craftsmanship and creativity that went into the making of Toy Story, I find aspects of the film's environments to be aesthetically unappealing. But don't get it twisted. Toy Story excels in its ability to connect us to toy characters that feel human in every way that the filmmakers intended. I felt anger when Woody allowed his jealousy to jeopardize Buzz's safety and Andy's happiness. I experienced a sense of righteousness when Woody, Buzz, and their newfound friends revealed their sentient nature to Sid. So play nice. Andy's sadistic, toy-torturing next-door neighbor. I was comforted when Andy discovered Woody and Buzz on the way to their new home. Every emotional beat hits like an Eggman mover's truck, and Pixar has been demolishing heartstrings with every subsequent film after that. For what I feel is the second best entry in Pixar's flagship franchise so far, I'll be giving Toy Story 8 Buzz Lightyears out of 10. Few films throughout animation history can say they changed the game like this one can, and we as audience members have been reaping the rewards ever since. It's been a pleasure to grow up alongside the Toy Story franchise, and it warms my animation-loving heart to know that Woody and Buzz will be entertaining generations to infinity and beyond. Dude!